Welcome. We're just getting started. Hello, everyone. I'm Anissa. I'm a librarian here at the library, and I work on programming, so I'm happy to have you here. Um, first off, I'd like to acknowledge that our library would like to acknowledge that we occupy the unceded and ancestral homeland of the Raw Mutishaloni people, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland, and as uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as first people. I encourage you all to check out the Oakland all-women-led organization called Segorite Land Trust. They're doing some great work in the land back movement, and o the city of Oakland is working with them on that, and that's amazing. Um, we have some upcoming events. It is Lunar New Year. Yes. We have a big event. Um, we have a couple big events happening. Next Saturday is a big lunar event down our Corette Auditorium. Um, as well as it being Lunar New Year, it's also Black History Month. So of course we have lots of events around black history. This um, coming Saturday we have an event in our Corette Auditorium, which is on our lower level. It's a beautiful space if you've never been in it. Um, we'll be having uh, audiobook narrator Paris Lane. We'll be talking about her newest audiobook called Abella. And what else do we have coming up? Oh, a really amazing event. We do a lot of events off-site. Um, coming up on Tuesday, February 27th, we'll be at the African American Art and Cultural Center, which is just like, boom, right down there about five blocks away on Fulton Street. And we're hosting author Margaret Wilkerson Sexton, who has an amazing book out called On the Rooftop, all about 1950s um, San Francisco in the jazz era, and really focusing on um, the renaissance that was happening here, but also gentrification. It's a really beautiful book. I encourage everyone to come check that out. It happens at seven o'clock, and doors open at 6.30, so please come check that out. And without those announcements, I wanna really thank um, Divan for being here. And this is our first in a four-part series for the year, so that's really exciting. Um, we will announce when the next ones will be, what locations they'll be at, and stay tuned for all of their exciting work. Um, so this has been an ongoing partnership for this, our second year working together, and I'm really thrilled to keep this continuing. And with that, I wanna thank Devan for being here, and I wanna thank all of you for being here, and I'm gonna turn it over to Isabel. Well, thank you for being here tonight. Um, I want to thank uh, Anissa Maladies, right, and uh, the staff from the San Francisco Public Libraries uh, for hosting uh, this uh, Divan quarterly series. So now, you know, every year, right, every three months, we'll have a reading uh, by Vietnamese American writers, maybe diasporic Vietnamese writers, and hopefully more and more also other Southeast Asian uh, writers and poets. Um, I want to also make a shout out to, uh, to our staff to make this uh, event possible, right? Uh, Caroline Ho, right, who is here. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Anvi uh, Fan, you know, thank you so much. And Cathy Nguyen, right, a CEO. Uh, just a lot of work behind the scenes, you know, for, for us to be able to bring uh, those events to you. So just, uh, it's good to acknowledge. And, and today is also about that. Uh, our next uh, public, uh, you know, our event with the public libraries will be on April 20 at the Ruby at 7.30 with Alexandra Wayne, T. Luong, Suzanne Liu, and Emmy Fan. So maybe we'll bring that up again, but put it on the calendar, please. Um, I mean, the one way to support us and, you know, the, the, the other writers uh, from the diaspora is, is to show up and be here and tell your friends. So, yeah. Uh, divans, uh, how many of you have known of Divan before coming here today? Oh, this is really nice. Yes, so we've been around for a long time. I've been around for a long time. I've been doing this for 20 years, bringing my students to the, you know, to the communities, organizing events. And really the reason we're doing all this effort is to, you know, for issue of visibility, right? To break the invisibility, the marginality, the not, you know, not being understood, being misunderstood, being a sale type, being not respected, not getting the fundings that we need to in order to for, 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 
for, for the groups, right? And then to push for uh, that visibility. So this is, this is about that, right? Uh, Divan is, is about social justice and, and, and for the, the community to be seen. Uh, this last year we became a non-profit organization. I uh, don't know what, what uh, we got into, right? This is a big learning curve for all of us. Um, and um, uh, so basically we have a comprehensive uh, programs, right, with public events. Actually, has show accented is uh, very likely to be aired on KPFA, you know, starting in the next month. Uh, we do uh, riders' residencies uh, internationally, workshops, uh, you know, providing, uh, uh, you know, like uh, craft workshops to riders, and then also for community members who want to tell the stories. And then uh, we are trying to uh, create, um, um, you know, um, open opportunities for writers to be published, right? Some of the book you see here is us working with imprints. And in a couple of years, we, you know, happy to say, you know, we'll have published, uh, you know, six, eight books by the end of this next year. So we're really making a difference by organizing together. And tonight is very special because a lot of the people working behind the scenes with Divan to provide this opportunity to support and uplift writers, uh, you know, are themselves writers. And uh, today is really also an opportunity for them to be seen and, 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 and to, you know, to, to, to be appreciated, yeah, uh, for their work as artists and also as activists. Um, okay, so uh, so you know we also, also always need support, right? So if you like to donate, if, if you can, I hate this part, but okay, I just did it. You know, just just go to the website and donate. <laughs> okay, I'll be better with time. <laughs> it doesn't get easier. I don't know about that part. Other people do it. It's just awful, but we we do need funding to make this happen. Uh, okay, so today is a special, uh, you know, the first launch of this series, so it's a big deal. And uh, the, you know, one person we invited is uh, Trong Tran and Damon Porter. Uh, Trong has uh, been, you know, is an old friend for, for many years and really le legends, right, for the communities here in San Francisco. So it's really nice to start uh, with both of them. Uh, both of them wrote uh, a book uh, called Looking and Seeing. So this is how, uh, why uh, this reading starts with them. Uh, Trong Tran was born in Saigon, Vietnam. He's the author of eight books of poetry, including A Four Little Words, Book of the Other, uh, Small in Comparisons, which won the American Book Award, and Looking and Seeing, which he co-authored with Damon Potter. And he, was, uh, he has won numerous awards, grant and fellowship. Trong lives in San Francisco and teach at Northwestern University, previously Mills College, in Oakland, California. And uh, his co-writer, like the person he, he wrote this book with, Damon Potter, lives and works in San Francisco. He's the author of Hundreds of Words and Looking and Seeing, which, are, you know, which they both co-authored. Uh, so please uh, welcome uh, our featured uh, poets, uh, Trong Trends and uh, Damon Potter. Hi, everyone. Um, I asked Damon to actually join me up here to, and we're going to read um, in, in tandem. Uh, and I think the reason why I wanted to do that was because we wrote this book in proximity to one another. Um, it was uh, right before the days of COVID um, and we were having lots and lots of conversations. And so um, and I thought it would be uh, the appropriate um, approach to, to read it. In, in tandem in such a way. Um, but before I do, I, I, I wanted to say, um, my book is called Looking and Seeing, and Damon's book, actually, and I, it's, a, it's a bit confusing, but Damon's book is called Seeing and Looking. And what, what it is is that we, we wanted to do something that was very um, experimental in the sense that we wanted to put, bring together two books and publish it within proximity to one another. So they're both in this, bound together in this book. Um, and sometimes we're in conversation, sometimes we're just kind of like kicking back and forth ideas, um, and sometimes we're just, just like in total disagreement, <laughs> or not. But 
that was the conversation that, that took place. And I'm telling you all this because um, last week when I was getting on an airplane to go to Kansas at, at, for Red Eye about midnight on, on that given night, I had a, an old uh, senior citizen moment. And I thought I left the stove on. And who would I call but Damon Potter to, to say, hey, I think I left the stove on. Can you go and check for me? So he actually got out of bed, got into his car, drove across town, and went to make sure that the stove was off. And sure enough, it was off. But I'm telling, I'm telling you this story because it was all the conversations that, that happened around this book and around 100 words that we wrote together that led to the, that moment. And, and Damien and I don't actually talk a whole lot about writing anymore. We talk about planting trees and building tables. But, um, but it took a lot of work for us to get to the conversation of building tables and planting trees. And um, it was all worth it. So thank you for being in conversation. Um, before I go further, also, thank you to Carolyn Ho, who designed this absolutely impossible book. Like because because I, I went to the publisher and I said, hey, I want to publish two books together as one book. And I want, I want it to be completely even as, as, as it moves through. So there's no front and there's no, there's no back covers to this book. And that, was, that took a lot of effort on Carolyn to make sure that it somehow came together. Thank you. It's a beautiful book. Even if no one reads it, we have it. And we're quite grateful for it. But thank you. Um, so we're just going to read. And, but I'm gonna, I've said enough, so I'm going to hand off the first part of the reading to Damon. You want me to start? Yeah. OK. I guess uh, I just want to start by saying thank you for being here and thank you for having me. Thank you, Trim. I find that my mom and I don't collide much. When I am high, when I am dry high and feeling fine, she is then sad. She has seen friends who are just dying. She, tr she tries not to say or tell me these things. She, I think, knows that I am a desert. And when I am feeling lay in bed rude, she has a hard time accepting my rue and bony fingers. And I have a hard time knowing she's dying how all people do and I will miss her. Some things are easier when written as poetry, when seen as metaphor, when say, it shook me, your words, when you declared yourself a loner. That something said about the self can cut so deeply in the other as to remind the other of his otherness. You wrote this to me, I am a loner. I read the words as leave me alone. I cannot tell you why those words cut the way they cut away. When I say I want to be left alone, so as to live alone, that is to say that I am lonely. I'm afraid of the answer to this question. But right about now, I need to ask, should I be leaving you alone? My dad would drive us to a lake, Lake Hennessy, specifically Condam when it was raining so we could see water fall in a big hole. I know my body will fall in a big hole and that's the worst that will happen to me. Oroville Dam is leaking, it's dead. There's water and algae and someday my prostate will squeeze all my limbs. Those of you who know me and my current um, reinvention of myself might have an, a way into this particular poem. Researching the fetish of masculinity or Sunday morning internet porn. On YouTube, there are videos of men exacting pain, each using the flat of a board to inflict pain upon another. The willing participant part anticipates. Hal struts about. He embraces each assailant, amassing his ma masculinity. The video, vi the video inevitably ends with him putting his bruised buttocks on display, on camera, this rite of passage, this badge of manhood. This thing they do, they do on YouTube, they do in life. I should be more like a blackberry thing, pricking aggressive, aggressive, the boorish and mean, and holding my fruit out two summer bowls. This country is racist and I receive, receive clout, bodily safety because I am white. 
White folks don't say it. We write our books about what we pick up or about fruit. It used to be that I would write to enact a desire for isolation. It was a way to say, I want to be left alone to my thoughts, with my words. I want you to leave me alone. You can't see that I'm trying. I'm trying to write. I'm thirsty. I'm writing these words to quench my thirst. I write alone in the hopes that I would write myself into exhaustion, into sleep. I did just that, and that was when you came to me carrying water in your mouth. You leaned into, you passed it along from mouth to mouth. Your lips, our lips did not touch. This was not a kiss. A kiss would have not led me here. You wake me from sleep by quenching my thirst. This lasted but a minute. I am thirsty again. Today I'm writing, it's usually to someone. I'm writing something. I want to hear it read out loud. I want to see it on a page, in a book. I want to see you inside these words. Where are you? I'm thirsty. How are you? Marguerite, not sure why I passed my time for asking you what you asked me. You demonstrated decency and me, well, we saw clear. I'm opponent to the thoughtful, dear. Eulogy for the living. A word is a breath, a line is breathing. I wake in the mornings to tell myself that I am not. That is to say, I have been avoiding this task at the water's edge, he called his mother, once sharp and precise. This is the line, these are pavers on a path towards. The sadness of living overwhelms this effort. He has left his shoes up on that bridge. I'm walking to know, I have the capacity to move. I'm drinking to hydrate from this feeling of drowning. Making is a response to all that's been taken. This writing, this breath, this breathing, this poem, I am eating to sustain through sustenance, though sustenance is suspect. A death did, not ha did happen to make this happen. That is to say, would I have written this at all? This is not a departing note. He marked the spot conveying distance. Or is it proximity? He wanted to be found. I thought I could hide in cryptic language until I got lost in cryptic language. I am not close to him. And still I know where, when, and why. That is to say, I don't like writing this. Now, blunt and bruising, this is the poem now as I know it. Trung my reluctance to say aloud thoughts is a considerate one in a bunch of dandelion pokers. I want to be sure that I've done my thinking, thought my braids out, morning and noontime, perhaps on till rest or when the moon's up. I'd like for patience to grow out a leaf cut without the thorns, sprout my own worm head, turn a bright stem, then a puff seed scent into a brick to grow this mutation of what whiteness trains. So before I read this poem, I want to tell a little anecdote about how this poem came to be. Um, and that, this is going to be my last poem, but um, I wrote this manuscript that took over 15 years to get published, and it went through the hands of four different publishers. Uh, the three of them were white publishers, and one is a um, uh, Asian American press, uh, Kaya. Not this particular book, but the book book of the other. And um, on one occasion, the the press, which ironically is named Nightboat, Nightboat told me to go deeper into my own trauma and racist racist racism enacted on me. And I, you know, and I, I was very earnest in saying, "Yeah, tell me how I should do that," as my editor. And I got ghosted. So. So, you know how we have um, revenge porn in the world? Uh, I actually think that revenge poetry is also another category. So, dear you, or etc. 
feel free to replace you with the pronoun of we. Not too many people can say that they left their home and their country on a boat. Well, okay, it was actually a ship, a Korean tanker to be exact. My family and I left in the hopes of finding a better life. In the case of my father, my mother would say it was about the preservation of life. I'm not writing this now out of, care, out of any desire to retell my story. I've written it more times than I care to count. I've given you and yours what, you ex what was expected. I'm writing this now for the purpose of learning this art of irony. How on, hold on to this knowing for the time being. Know that my people have been called boat people by your people. Who gets to ask the person experienced trauma and racist practices to take their work further into the examination of race on a personal and societal level? Trauma around racist practice, et cetera. In full disclosure, it was the et cetera that set it off. I am asking you this in response to your response. Work, who, you. The use of words to express something other than, and especially the opposite of the literal meaning. A usually humus, humorous or sardonic literary style or form characterized by irony, an ironic expression or utterance. This is a new story. I am telling this story as a joke 43 years in the making. It's taken me this long to arrive at some semblance of a punchline. How could I have known that you would come along to deliver such a pithy narrative thread? Now that I have it, you will just have to wait. Wait for it, wait. Incongruity between the actual result of a sequence of events and the normal or expected result. An event or result marked by such incongruity. Incongruity between a situation developed in a drama and the accompanying words or actions that is understood by the audience, but not the characters in the play, called also dramatic irony, tragic irony. The boat person was floating in the ocean. He was hoping that the boat passing in the night would be so kind as to pick him up. The person on that boat, having decided not to pick the boat person up, went through a transformation. He became we for the purpose of responding to the boat person's ask. In the pronoun of we, perhaps as a way to show some unifying presence, some collective consciousness, a collateral of sorts, he said, we all empathize with the speaker, but agreed that we wanted to see the work go further into his examination of the issues it set out to encourage race on a personal and societal level, trauma around racist practice, etc. When asked by the boat person how he could go further into his own trauma or racist practices that was happening to him, the pronoun we chose not to respond for some reason or another. Without responding to the specifics of the boat person's question, the pronoun we floated away on that boat. The boat person could hear their collective voices saying, we want to support you in completing this project. How, asked the boat person as he floated boatless in the night, as the night boat floated further away. I am learning irony so that I can say, write the story. Not the immigrant story of my family, not the story of trauma or racist practices enacted on brown and black bodies. That story was written. It is being written and I will write it again and again and again. This is a particular story written to be told as a joke full of what I think is irony. A Vietnamese writer labeled as a boat person by a by white people gets his manuscript rejected by a group of white people on account that he did not go deep enough into his account of race on a personal societal level. Trauma around racist practices, etc. 
But that's not the irony or humor of the story. Wait for it. The white people are part of this literary endeavor. Wait for it. They go by the name of Nightboat. Get it? Boat people, Vietnamese people, white people, white boat, night boat. <laughs> A pretense of ignorance, of willingness to learn from another assumed in order to make the other's false conceptions conspicuous by adroit questioning. Is this funny? Have I gone further into my examination of the work? Are you laughing? Am I laughing? Would you say that this is irony? This is ironic? And still I ask, is this funny? Is this far enough? Do you get it? It's a joke. It's on you. It's on me. Are you laughing with me? Are you laughing at me? Should I be laughing along? Are you laughing? Etc. Note. The definition of irony has been provided for the purpose of reading this work in case you still think I got this all wrong. I'm prepared to go further in, in its examination of the issues it sets out to engage race on a personal and societal level, trauma around racist practices, etc. The work is it, the it is I. No need to emphasize being that we are all boat people here, you in the form of we claim it so. I was called this, and so I guess that makes me so. Perhaps you as we can give me guidance on where to go. On second thought, forget I ask. I think I know where not to go. Thanks for the inspiration to write this, the above. I rather like it in an ironic sort of way. And still I ask, is this funny? Irony, noun. Irony, also, irony. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here. And thank you, uh, Jung and Damon, for that really powerful reading. Um, it's just an amazing book, and um, I hope you all go out and, and get a copy. <laughs> None here, um, but forthcoming. Uh, so as uh, Isabel reiterated um, earlier, the, in keeping with our theme to celebrate the Lunar New Year, we really um, want to recognize and appreciate Devan staff. These are the people who work so hard behind the scenes. Writers for Writers is our theme for the evening, and these folks give it their all every day to make events like this happen. And they themselves are also writers and poets. So we want to celebrate them um, this evening. So with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first reader is Anvi Fan. Anvi is our fearless communications coordinator and does all of our beautiful designs, coordinated this event um, with Carolyn Ho. And um, she's doing tremendous work, and we're so proud of her. Um, so welcome, Anvi. Hi everyone, um, so I wrote this piece eight months ago, kind of reflecting on love and the different forms of love that there are, um, and in doing so I really, um, you know, I am my mother's daughter, and I see my mother in all parts of me, and so this is kind of just um, discussing that. <laughs> There are a lot of things I don't know about love in my own heart. There are things I'm unlearning and relearning every day. But one thing I know for sure is that my little fragile heart cannot handle long distance. It aches when I see Michael's face illuminated on my phone screen, nested in the palm of my hands. So close I can almost smell his must-scented deodorant, but far away enough that I know it's just a memory I'm holding on to until the next time I can take a big whiff of him. It aches when I catch my first glimpse of him in person after a long while of not seeing each other. It aches a little more when I collapse into his arms, because I know that although we have this moment and the moments in between, there is always a see you later looming in the air. It aches the most at the airport when I'm desperately clinging onto his arms, sobbing into his chest, begging him to stay. 
It's almost childlike, the way I shrink from a 23-year-old to a five-year-old, looking up at him with glossy eyes and pink nose. It's almost like if I plead enough, if I try doing whatever it is I can at this airport, he can stay, even just a moment longer. And my heart absolutely breaks every single time I lose sight of him as he walks through TSA. It breaks every single time. And I cling on to it, my little heart, and soothe it until I can see him again. Until our goodbyes no longer have to be goodbyes, but rather, see you tonight, babe, or I'll be back from the grocery store soon. And when our good nights no longer have to end with the end call button, but rather a small kiss before we snuggle up and turn off the lights. I stroke this hair of mine with these hands that will eventually find themselves upon my cheeks, wiping away the streams of longing and lust, and, fidget, and will fidget among themselves as I alone sit on this bar on my way back to a house without my home. And in that moment of extreme heartbreak, of extreme longing and love, I think about my mother. And in a parental way, I wonder if my mother's heart breaks the same way mine does. I wonder if it broke the same way when her husband said goodbye without really saying goodbye, drifting off to a land of eternal rest. I wonder if it broke when she left all that she knew, her friends, her first love, and her family. I wonder if it broke when she reluctantly let go of my hands, summer 2018, walking into the elevator and looking into the brown eyes that were just like hers one last time. And if it broke again this past May, realizing her child is no longer all hers, but belonging to a world greater than anything she'd known. My mom has broken my heart many, many times in many different ways. But I wonder if she only broke my heart because I broke hers. We aren't so different, my mother and I. Our hearts break the same, I think, because our hearts are the same. Sorry. Um, I'm also going to hand off the mic to Annika Lay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here, um, and I feel really honored to read um, alongside all of these brilliant artists. Uh, I'm going to re read one poem today um, that comes from a larger collection I've been working on called Meet Me in the Mangroves. Um, five years ago, I was kayaking in western Florida with my dad, um, and we were weaving throughout these um, channels that were lined with mangroves. Um, I'd seen mangroves before, but I was just really struck by them in this particular moment, um, just by how beautiful and uh, like mysterious they seemed. Um, if you're not familiar, mangroves are those sprawling trees that often line um, tropical shorelines. They have those really tangled, complex root systems, um, and they're sort of partially in water, partially on land, um, and they're found in brackish water. Um, and while we were kayaking, my dad was telling me um, that the mangroves reminded him of his childhood in Saigon, um, and I was just really moved by um, this special moment and by the mangroves. And so I've since done some light research on mangroves um, and I've learned that they're often the first line of defense during natural disasters. So they protect communities and they protect um, land. And their, their roots are so coiled and so embedded in those shorelines that their knots are literally what hold land intact. Um, and they also have these uh, special breathing roots that allow them to like breathe together and communicate with their network of mangroves. So I was just so inspired by this and struck by that moment with my dad, um, just the beauty and the strength and the protective nature of the mangroves. Um, it made me think of my family, of my community, of my diaspora, um, particularly the women in my family. So of course I had to write about it. Um, and so here is one poem from a series of many poems I wrote about mangroves. Um, and this is Mangroves number two. It's those mangroves that hold us up. Snarled limbs lean shoulder to shoulder. Nerve maze keeps sand sound. Margins anchored. Shell and all, my grandmother can put an entire shrimp into her mouth. 
Her quick tongue deconstructs the entire thing, seamlessly husks glossy armor, pinky flesh untainted. Seconds later, her chopsticks collect loosened shrimp shells, a tower crane rotating in a blink. She sweeps those remains swiftly to the edge of her plate. All the while, her face remains gracefully expressionless, exceptionally neutral. When the storms hit, mangroves take the first blow. Swell waves splatter up against coasts. It's those mangroves, chain-linked, hedge-like. They repel the wreckage, ward off monsters. My dad never preferred shells of any kind. On rare nights, when they'd have fresh crab legs, the other kids sucked claws clean, eagerly cracked chitin. His mom knew she'd scramble up a few eggs into a perfectly yellow ripple just for him. It's those mangroves that keep the pulse, even when uprooted. I struggle to find sleep. My mind takes hikes through treacherous bluffs, past peaks haunting. I always think of my grandmother and my aunts who never sleep, lay deadlocked in sheets. On treks through memories, she sweeps those remains swiftly. That time she found a human ear in the street fa, or when the monks blew to bits. The men to their sides snore rich melodies. It's those mangroves that respirate in the toughest of climes, mud and brine. It's those pores that stretch. Thank you. <laughs> and now we have Carolyn Ho. Hi, it's very good to be here. Thank you to Devan for being Devan and for hosting this reading and all the good work that Devan does and has done. So I'm really proud to have um, been there and to continue to support them and um, feel lucky. So uh, this is called Duck It or Duck Duck or This Is How Space Breaks. My son's father and I have a safe word to de-escalate conversations not going well. He refused to name one, so I did. Duck, from my son's workbook. A mama duck and a baby duck swim and dive and live in monosyllabic simplicity. We are going back to basics. Solid, sharp words to say, to repeat, to respect. Duck, as in duck for cover or for duck's sake. You are a ducking duck. <laughs> Duckhead, go duck yourself. Your whole ducking family is ducking ducked, you duck. <laughs> duck you, mother ducker. It was a good choice. Ducks are cute, round, fluffy. They like breadcrumbs in the park. They bob like soap suds. One time in the bath, I fell and I thought I would die there and held my breath like I hold the spirit of my landlord's dead son who had died there, or my dog who had died there. Maybe a marriage is a dog's final exhale that floats to the surface and passes away. There are so many ways to float, to be silenced, to get my ducks in a row and roast them, hang them by the neck on display in a dim sum deli shop, the eyes baked down, the mouth open, we are all heart and red, succulent and hanging, like barbecue ducks, gaping, plotting escape plans, quietly dangling, a rubber neck coiled on a hook. The water rises every day, the rising laundry, the percolating coffee, the packed lunch and duck hunt. I'm collapsed from one day breaking words into the next duck, duck it. <laughs> um, thank you. My marriage is not going well, so 
that's not, but it's, it's fine. It's not over, but it's not, it's not there. Um, uh, the next poem is called uh, Red. And this is in a time when I was learning Vietnamese. Um, I'm still trying, but it's expensive. Um, and what happens when you have this hybrid consciousness is that words that make sense in English that you learn in Vietnamese take on a layered meaning. And so red, Mao Da, reminded me of Mao, like Chairman Mao. That's, they have nothing to do and everything to do with each other. So Vietnamese voters make up the largest Asian demographic in favor of Trump, said a 2020 headline from the Stanford Daily. And you all better vote. The color of Vietnamese is red. A communist red is Mao, of a small chairman in a yellow star. Crispy, tiny feet marching in unison to one song. An army for my mother who wants to be loved, wants to go constantly to the bathroom. She hears the choir sing in unison, red rushing out like birds, out, arms outstretched. A girl in full napalm, we are naked and photographed, running in free fall and the singing my mother hears is like love, a bruised, shaped obedience, unflinching, paternal. She escaped this violent love story, boat story, but after 40, 50, 60 years of American dreams in American pants, being a free American manicurist, touching da feet of so many da mothers dotted in her Vietnamese papers, she finds comfort in the old ways. Mao's ways. She is looking for her dictator, the absolute father, the right way to be slapped, her chairman. There is something about him, that Donald, that Republican red promise. It compels like an old bird song in unison, a flaming orange glow, a golden toupee, a swelling red pulped to purple, a swelling of captivity. She is red and alone with the loss of her people. She is lost in Daw. She grabs my son's arm at Christmas and he flinches. Do you love me? And he is silent. Thank you. So I would, I have the weird alphabetical honor and privilege of introducing Isabel next. Uh, that is Devan's esteemed and fearless leader, and I am so excited to hear her um, read, because I always hear her, but I never get to hear her work, you know? It's always about Devan, so let's please give a warm welcome to Isabel. Well, I, I came here with all frazzled, you know, thinking of like, oh, how are you going to bring more money for Devan and this and that? I'm here, I'm like... Okay, I love you all, I'm inspired, it's all this work is worth it, we got to get going, I have no ideas how talented you guys are, oh, we should have done this way back, we do this again, okay, this is wonderful, so yeah, so anyway, I'm, I'm happy now, uh, so yeah, so, so yes, yeah, so, um, so yes, I don't usually write, you know, I basically uh, decided to, you know, uh, to, to devote my life to support other writers for different reasons. Uh, here I have a piece actually is and we published soon and the reason it came about is an accident because uh, Bindan asked me to write uh, a piece about uh, mother uh, for an art book that he was publishing and uh, maybe I read the email too fast because I was so busy and I wrote about my mother and I sent it to him. He's like, oh, I thought we were going to write an academic paper about mothers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't have time to write another one, so, so that's that. Um, okay, anyway, it's just, um, okay. Um, so this was, a, starting with the reflections uh, about the ideas of, you know, uh, you know, I teach Asian American study, ethnic studies, and then one thing, uh, you know, I taught for 20 years is the idea of know history, know yourself. You know, it's like, yeah. Uh, and then uh, I, I have been uh, thinking about this quite a bit. So uh, so this is the end of the stories so reflect about that. But beginning is, you know, trying to, uh, to understand my mother. It's a lot about mothers. Um, uh, we often talk about our mothers. There's something about Vietnamese mothers, you know, holding it all, but, you know, sometimes at a cost, right? Uh, anyway, so this is the end of that story after I tell my mother's story. 
A story is only a story, and once it is told, it becomes a ghost, a rock, or an angel. To know my history is not a given. Could mother have a point to not tell me the truth in full? Could living with the guilt of not being as good as a mask be better than living with shame? If she could, mother would tell me, my American teacher, that they spoke nonsense about the knowledge of history being tied with the knowledge of the self, and then to live with guilt in order to survive and thrive is truly not such a terrible thing. It is at least better than me knowing her real story, for it will risk making me too angry or too sad. It could push me away from her, break a bond, the very thing she fears the most. That's all she truly possessed, after all, and she needed me to save her. Although I like to think of myself as a decider of my own destiny, it is clear now that I have been hers all along. My coming to America to live with her sister number nine, who blamed her for her marriage without a cent in my pocket, was not my running away from father or from racism, as I used to tell. It was her plan. It is me walking through the dark tunnel she had dug with her nails days and nights for a decade, her gamble. No matter the cost, she will get there and win. There was no turning back. I like to think that it was to make it easier for me to leave, that when I asked her if she loved me, when I was starving for such words at 18, she paused and after what seems like a very long time answered, it's my duty. She did not make it in America because she had missed her mother too much. I did not give you love so that you could leave without looking back and succeed, not like me, she now tells me. Maybe it is better to never have hope to start with. That is the loss of hope that drove mother to gamble her life and that the life of a child. After the Clorox incidents, the day after my two birds died and I had run out of the street barefoot in my white gown in the middle of night to escape father's wrath, mother went in the back of the garden. I was 10 years old. It was uh, April 30, 1975. Maybe now I know why. With a mixture of gravel dirt and compost, she made a mask for me. She had more time on her hand to make it this time. She tried to remember what Kuan Yin from her mother's altar and the joconde of her old textbooks looks like. It was so long ago. My mask, she made sure to tell me as she put it on my face, would not be as powerful as hers. She made it special so that it covered the top of my head because she said it was full of birds that soared too high each time a human came close. I had to stop trusting people, she said, for my protection. She carved the mouth shut in the shape of a light smile so that my voice would be muffled and not be heard. It is with mother's mask on that I went on living after that. I could not remove it. At first it worked well. It was a relief not to be seen and not to be heard. But I also spent years waiting for drops of joy to fall from the sky. When they came, I laid in a clear, clearing covered with grass and daisies, eyes open wide matching the smile of my mask. I caught as much as I could catch, taking everything in. It is in one of these moments that I caught the idea that people are believers, that we all carry a story in our head that echoes, I'm good or I'm bad, I belong to the best or I belong to the bad. For my story pops a bubble that attaches to the back of a belly button. In the bubble floats five words, I'm afraid of you or I'm afraid of me. We pick up crumbs on the ground and signs from the stars. We fight to keep the covers of our story clean, extra shiny even. We think in shadow and light. Some of us are serve a story in a bottle at birth. Some of us spend a lifetime searching for crumbs to satisfy the hunger that makes no sense to those born with a story in a bottle. And then there is always the shade of our skin, how much coins we have in our pockets, whether we are born a boy or a girl or something in between. If we hold this or that passport, how beautiful we look, our health, and whether we are at the right place at the right time, our skill and how learned we are to tell and believe stories. For better or worse, I have inherited Father's scissors, the one I've used to cut his journal and books from which I pick up a few words to put on the page. From mother, I've learned to gamble, not to win, but to break even, maybe. To move away from the needle of survival, to walk the path of living. 
My gamble is to yank my mother's mask from my face and fine tune if I cannot possibly smash it, the small compass I've inherited from her head in my head, and be willing to face the end of the world will I ever succeed. In my mouth is the memory of the taste of crumbs I ate too fast out of hunger for her story. I line, up, I line up what I can remember of the shapes up to my eyes and try hard not to close them. I call mother before I betray her. Hi, mom. What happened? Nothing, just calling to say hi. Are you okay? Yes. Are you? Yes, I am. What do we do now? I think I know. Thank you. Thank you. So now it's a pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Julie T. Handerhills and all friends who've been with Ivan for since the beginning. Uh, you know, she's uh, you know talks write a lot about Cham, Cham being Cham Americans. A lot of you know, like Vietnam is like 50 minor, more minorities, right, ethnic minorities. Uh, Vietnamese have, you know, like killed too many cham, but not all died. Uh, and then uh, Julie is here to tell her story and the story of her mother. She's a poet, a teacher, and a grand writer. Welcome, Julie. I'm going to read a short poem from 2009, followed by a memoir piece I wrote a couple of weeks ago, followed by a little longer poem I wrote in 2008. To hold a beating heart. To hold a beating heart within is enough. To know the hair's breadth wait for life to continue after the pause between each silence. Dust jackets. My earliest exposure to poetry was through books by Shel Silverstein, gifted by my father's second wife, Lynn, an eighth grade art teacher who nourished my love of reading. She bought me Where the Sidewalk Ends and A Light in the Attic, two hardcover collections of poetry with simple line drawings. I liked how each poem was easy to understand, yet also playful. The poem about Sarah Cynthia Sylvia Stout, who wouldn't take the garbage out, culminated in a transcontinental pile of trash. By then, it was too late. It was an epic warning to do one's chores, yet mostly it was an absurd catastrophe, fun to imagine. Sometimes Shell snuck in bits of deeper wisdom as a teacher of children. In his short poem about hearing impaired Donald who fell in love with talkative Sue, yet neither understood the other. The way they each expressed love was unintelligible to the other. And yet even a seven-year-old girl in Texas could sense a timeless warning beneath the poem's calm exterior. Remember the way someone else expresses love isn't always like your own. Pretty heavy, huh? But with rhyming couplets, it flowed like song and like songs listened to over and over. I came to memorize that poem and many others through return and recitation. I learned the pleasure of revisiting a story even when I know how it ends. Over time, one dust jacket grew ragged and the other disappeared, as did Lynn's marriage with my father. One day after his violence, Lynn left him. By third grade, all I had left of Lynn were the books she'd bought me, until years later when I found my, step, my first stepmother living in Michigan. We began corresponding and eventually reunited in my early 20s when I met Lynn's best husband and only biological daughter. We remain in touch. Several years ago, I texted Lynn a note of appreciation as a reason I began reading poetry. You were writing it too, she added. Your first poem was about playing in puddles in the rain. Until that moment, I'd played my, I placed my first written poetry at age nine because those are the earliest poems I still have. Even after her prompt, I couldn't recall writing or sharing that first poem, 
but Lynn remembers my first poem the way I remember the poems she gave me. When I am like this, it's probably because some days still act like summer, but then other days the chilly gray seeps into my bones and the apartment manager doesn't really turn on the heat. My bay windows, although beautiful, are poorly insulated and I received a rent increase to go with the recession. I bought a down throw so I won't be as cold as I read at night as my 7.99 Black Friday splurge and this is my throwdown. But the whole point of this missive is facing why I keep not being able to write a 20-page paper that's due too soon. I read articles and chapters and take notes but can't write. I'm afraid I'll overreach with notes, then fuck myself with too much to do in the final weeks. What's my problem? This time of year, for one. So Gina sent me a Dharma talk on Home by Thich Nhat Hanh, which resonated so resolutely her translation for me, even with its linguistics assessment of Vietnamese kinship and all pronoun expressions of connection, the very words I have learned these past months. How do I consider home in my heart despite the silences this world has asked of me, quieting the fits and the unfit, the starts and the endings, the distances I cannot remedy, the fissures and slippages and losses, and I won't do my dishes, although I should, or even cook when I'm like this, since I only really want to cook well when I cook for others. Perhaps I can trick myself into a sort of cunning hospitality and mindfully consider myself an other, so I'd be willing to procrastinate writing my paper at least by brightening my life with a fabulous meal when I am like this. But I haven't enough fresh vegetables in the fridge, so instead of writing the paper I should be writing, I write poetry that reaches its hand into my heart and rings it to sleep. A temptation, but I can't sleep, no. I need to get more done, even at 2 a.m. Maybe I will start with a cup of tea, start again with a cup of tea, and while the kettle boils, I'll do five dishes, a peace offering. Thank you. And now I have the honor to introduce Kathy Wynn, who is, along with Issa, the other significant pillar holding up DVAN as our COO. We are very, very grateful to have you with us, and I'm very excited to hear your work. So. All right. Um, so I'm going to read an excerpt from a longer work in progress. It is a novel of historical fiction. <clears throat> Saigon, 1975. Two weeks after, the plum trees have bloomed, showering Saigon with canopies of white and pink blossoms. A girl named Lin Lang Thi, with a bright red mark over her left eye, follows a woman with a pockmarked face who gives her candy. He wears a green dress with a red apple on it, sucking on the tamarind sweet. They wind through alleyways, past crowded markets filled with food stalls, tended by cooks fanning the embers of their charcoal grills, past women hawking Buddha's hands and sticky rice wrapped in banana leaves. Old men and women sit on low wooden stools, exchanging gossip and the latest news of the war. Teenage boys crouch in doorways, plotting revenge. Army helicopters carrying wounded soldiers were above them, heading to the military base. The woman with the pockmarked face tells T they're almost there. They're going to see a man who, the woman tells her, helps children. The woman says she'll like it there, lots of children to play with. But T has to behave. She has to obey like the others. Thi nods, not caring where they go, so long as sugar stays on her tongue. Thi can talk now, but she mostly listens, taking everything in, speaking only when she has to. 
They wend their way through the busy streets of Saigon onto a white boulevard with tall, leafless trees, white paint rings circling the trunks. No one notices, no one pays attention to them, just another woman with a child trailing behind her. Air sirens blare, the sound is deafening. Thea covers her ears. Thea has been gone all day. No one misses her, not until the late afternoon when a neighbor asks the housekeeper where the child with the red mark on her eye has gone. The neighbor hasn't seen the child playing alone in the alley as usual. The nanny is busy tending to the baby boy. She doesn't notice when Thea wanders off. The housekeeper scolds the nanny, a girl herself, barely 16. The neighbors begin searching for the missing child, calling, They round up the neighborhood boys who scatter like pigeons. The boys jump on their bicycles, pedaling furiously down side streets. The boys stop passersby, describing the missing child the best they can. She was wearing a dress, though they're not sure. Maybe it was shorts. Yes, that's it, red shorts. Her hair tied into a knot on top of her head, the nanny said. That she remembered. One thing is certain, the girl has a red mark on her eye. It's unfortunate, said the neighborhood women. She might be pretty otherwise. Such a shame. At the headquarters of the South Vietnamese Army in Saigon, Thi's father receives the news during a meeting. Upon learning his child is missing, Major Lin Than Viet storms out of the building, accompanied by two soldiers. He runs toward the gate, shouting for army jeeps. He stops mid-stride, turns, and races to the Miu Ba. The major had erected a shrine at the base in honor of a woman warrior <clears throat> whose husband had been killed in battle by French invaders a hundred years before. The woman warrior took up her sword to avenge her husband, fighting on horseback, her child tied to her back, her long black hair whipping around her like a shield. She fought alongside her husband's troops at the Battle of Giwa, fending off the French before their cannons pummeled the Saigon citadel, annihilating thousands of Vietnamese soldiers and the woman warrior, her child still clinging to her back. She became known as the Lady Spirit. Men and women worshiped her. Soldiers prayed to her before going into battle. The Lady Spirit had saved the Major's life more than once. From the swamps of Gamau to the jungles of Ben Maithut, she had guided him, speaking to him in dreams, keeping him alive when soldiers were killed all around him. The shrine stands in the shade of an enormous banyan tree, its gnarled limbs and wide branches fanning out like a fortress. The dirt path to the sh shrine is strewn with flowers, scattered by the wives of South Vietnamese soldiers, living and dead, who come to pray and make offerings of fruit and rice wine to the lady. The major approaches the shrine quietly, his heart pounding. He lights incense and clasps his hands together in prayer, bowing down and kneeling before the carved wooden statue of the lady spirit. Sweat streams down his face, Please help me find my child, he says. I would give my life for her. Please help me. Major, says the driver, folding his cap in his hands. The jeeps are ready, sir. Vit glances back at the lady spirit, his eyes pleading. He gets into the jeep, his jaw clenched. The guard at the gate salutes him. A second guard opens the gate. City sounds magnify. Motorbikes honk their horns, weaving between Ciclo drivers and three-wheel lambrettas. A stream of schoolgirls in white aoyai on bicycles, shiny Citroëns and Chevrolets, Volkswagen buses, heavily loaded army trucks, a swarm of Vespas, the smell of diesel thick in the air. 
For a moment, Viet remembers his life before the war, before his child was born, and nothing is yet lost. Thank you. And now I have the honor of introducing Sidney Vang Tho. He is our publications coordinator and also the deputy editor of our um, online literary journal, Diacritics. Sidney is also uh, working on his PhD at UC Berkeley. Welcome, Sidney. It's great to be here. Uh, I, I'm really blown away by these poems. Um, I think that one thing Vietnamese people all have in common is we have really crazy family stories. <laughs> I, it's like when I talk to another Vietnamese person and then we start trading stories, I, I just expect that they'll say something crazy to me. And I don't, I don't want to say powerful stories because it seems moralistic, um, but that's how I feel. Um, and you know, everyone who's been reading so far, um, I feel like you guys have all had such amazing ways of reading and being storytellers. Um, so I, I have two poems about my grandma. A Chia, that is the name for my mother's mother in Hakka. I asked the question, which I never know how to ask, what was the war like? <coughs> she answers the only way that she can by telling the story of her entire life, because there is nothing which the war did not touch. <clears throat> How can you recognize death when it is everywhere? It is as if I'm seeing her face for the first time. How can you think about death when everyone else is thinking about food? My grandmother at the market, listening for the sound of bombs, gathering her cone hats like a tower on her head, her powers of balance in a time of emergency. It is supposed to be funny, she reminds me, and I am seeing her face for the second time. On other occasions, she is shouldering her bags of syrup and dragging a block of ice behind her so that she can keep selling shaved ice. Our country is already hot enough as it is without being bombed and we all want shaved ice. Because this is the greatest surprise, that you can live through war and not know what death is. But neither do I, not having lived through war, know what death is. But I do not know death the way that my grandmother does not know death. And not knowing that, what do I know of her? I am seeing her face for the final time. Thank you. Um, and here's, a, here's another poem. My grandmother was married at 18. I ask if it was some, something she wanted. She laughs at me. What did it matter what she had wanted, she asked back. It is a story that still confuses me. The person who wept the most on her wedding day changes every time. <laughs> it was her aunt lamenting because my grandmother's father, who cared more about character than wealth, had given her away to a man who refused to concede that war compromises us all. Or it was my grandmother's father, because her aunt, who could no longer spoil her, had given her away to this poor country doctor. Or was it my lonely grandmother, because she could not bring herself to behead a chicken for my grandfather, failing her first task as a wife? Or is it me that is crying, as I find myself wishing against this marriage and the marriages of all the women in my family and wishing against myself. But still, none of us have finished mourning my grandfather's passing 10 years ago. Did she want to marry him? Is it a question she can answer now, seven decades on? What does it matter now, what she had wanted then, she would ask. I will be married next month. On her wedding day, my grandmother was worried that it would be all too expensive, that her heels would be stuck in the mud, that she would never see her aunt again, that my grandfather would always be a stranger to her. On my wedding day, my grandmother can just eat. Thank you. 
So I'll be introducing Vina Vo, who's been with DVED for such a long time. Um, and she's always juggling so many different activities and projects. Um, and her coffee and tea company is finally having its official launch um, in, in a week or so. Um, and so she'll be reading a bit from um, a, her manuscript that she's working on. Thanks, Sydney, and congrats on your wedding. I'm so glad your grandma can just eat. Hope she eats a lot. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, my name is Vina, and I'll be reading a short excerpt, well, not really short, somewhat short excerpt from a novel I've been working on. So I'm really excited to be able to share it with you. First time I've been reading it out loud, so I'm feeling a little nervous, but thanks for, for being here and witnessing that. All right. So this, um, this piece takes place in the Mekong in the early 80s. When Mai was born, slipping out of my mother bloodied and screeching, the midwife examined the two flaps between her legs and declared her a girl. See, I told you, my mother said to my father, but Goham was right. So just short of seven years old, I became Ji Hai. But Gohaum, our village's most revered fortune teller, was an elderly woman, skin dripping from her face like an old wax candle. But the white of her eyes were still as bright as the full moon, her pupils dark as night. The village people claimed that her eyes were actually the gateway into the spiritual realm. As legends went, at the age of four, Bakohaum was bitten on the ankle by a poisonous snake. Instead of succumbing to the venom, which traveled up her legs, a shaman prayed for the snake to spare the young child. In return, she would atone for the sins of the snake by helping people escape misfortunes. According to my mother, the fortune teller told her that marrying my father was either going to be a great choice or a horrible one. Even she, in all her divinity, could not predict which it would be. Some things are left to the skies, but if you marry him, you will have two daughters, and these two daughters will be very beautiful and very talented. My mother told me that that promise alone was enough for her to take this chance at this marriage. She took a chance with the fortune teller's prediction, and from the way her eyes crinkled upwards, I could tell she was satisfied with her choice. Ba, on the other hand, didn't believe in Bakoham's readings. He didn't believe that our fates were already predetermined and that someone could read the whims of the skies. Or maybe, like our neighbors, he was also hoping for a baby boy, someone to take on his trade when he became too old to work. Girls were short-term investments who could help you in, with housework when they were living under your roof. But once they left, they belonged to their husband's family. That night, I couldn't wait to see Ba like the firecrackers that I found hidden in his wooden trunk. Firecrackers were usually reserved for Thet each year to ward off evil spirits. Despite how little rice each household had in their stone jars, they would allocate enough funds for this important symbolic start to the year. Aside from Thet, the only other time people in our village lit firecrackers was to welcome a baby boy into the village. There were times I watched as disappointed faces begrudgingly stripped down the dangling red banner from their home when a girl was born. But Ba was different. Surely a healthy baby girl was worth celebrating too. I waited and waited until I heard Ba snoring next to me. The firecrackers would be wasted, sneaking around in a tightly wound plastic bag. I wondered if he had prepared firecrackers for my birth and if each fuse wrapped in stocky red paper lay forgotten and misshapen, their casings no match for the Mekong humidity. I laid in bed, tossing and turning, swatting mosquitoes, nipping at my ankles. Every time I closed my eyes, visions of evil spirits coming to our home to take away my baby sister jolted me awake. There were parts of our village that were haunted with lost and anguished souls, wandering without a home. The ancestors who lived on our altar were supposed to protect um, our family and serve as a first line of defense for these evil spirits. But I didn't know these people, and I couldn't trust them to protect my sister. I heard from the aunties in our village that the more beautiful and precious a child, the more evil spirits wanted to steal them away. That was why parents gave children unattractive nicknames that lowered their desirability. Since Mai didn't have that nickname yet, she was unprotected. Her defense was weak. No fireworks, 
no trusty ancestors, no nickname, but luckily she had me. I was the oldest sister, the Ji Hai, and I wasn't about to let any spirits take away my new baby sister. I, cold, I quietly rolled out of bed and tiptoed to my father's wooden chest. It was dark, but I maneuvered slowly, tracing the floor with my feet to find a clear path. I felt, I felt around the plastic bag and clutched it with my fingers, feeling the weight of it tugging my arm towards the ground. Following the moonlight, I found my way out of our home and gazed up at the sky. What was a peaceful night with only the sounds of crickets and cicadas chirping in the backdrop became an explosive orchestra. Suddenly, dogs were barking and I could hear our neighbors cursing out their windows. My father ran out, still only in his underwear, his eyes bulging out of their sockets, his mouth agape. What are you doing, he yelled, yanking me towards him. Tears began to well up in my eyes and I yelled back, you weren't going to scare away the spirits from my, so I did. The sound of the firecrackers ended, the last bit of gunpowder, now just a shell of paper and cardboard. Inside our house, I could hear Mai's high-pitched wail. It was a sound I wasn't yet familiar with. Baz's face softened as he pulled me in with lighter force this time and knelt down so he could fold me into his arms. Do you know why we don't light firecrackers for girls? He asked. Because families want boys, I responded. He laughed placing his, fing uh, his hands on my shoulders. No, it's because girls are more fierce than anything in this world. Spirits are already scared of them. <laughs> I wiped my eyes with the back of my hand and gulped for air, trying to find my breath again. I felt embarrassed at my misunderstanding and the ruckus I had caused in the middle of the night. With my head and shoulders slumped, I broke free from Baz's embrace and began cleaning up the remains from the firecrackers. Leave it, he said. I'll clean it in the morning. Let the spirit see that Mai has an older sister who will light up the night sky to protect her. Thank you. That concludes our program. Thank you so much to all of our amazing readers, to Jung, to Damon, Anvi, Annika, who am I missing? Carolyn, Mina, Isabel, Julie. You're amazing. Thank you all. Sydney. Uh, I introduced Sydney, so I was like, oh, wait, who am I missing? Um, thank you so much. Uh, there are some light refreshments in the back, so please feel free to help yourselves. Um, if, for those of you who registered via Eventbrite, we do have an event survey, feedback survey. If you could um, kindly fill that out, that really helps us with uh, grants and applications and also to improve our programming. So thank you so much for spending this evening with us. And thank you to SFPL and Anissa. Thank you. Wow, Divan is amazing. And just the women, woo, fierce. Thank you all for being here and have a wonderful night. Thank you all. Thank you.